Welcome to the Run for God Run Club, where you will find God in a runner's space. Welcome back to the Run for God Run Club. This is your one stop each week to be motivated and inspired to get off the couch and onto the running trail where you can, in turn, inspire others to do the same. Let's learn, laugh, and leap into running together, giving God the glory for what we are able to do in His name. Amen. Well, I am your running host, Dean Thompson, coming to you from the Upward Sports Studio once again. Do you like checklists? We hear variety is the spice of life, but sometimes being routine is a good thing. And we're going to share a story about that today that not only tells you why it's good, but gives us some instruction as to how to do it. And then I'm going to address one of those automated responses we often have to the question, how are you today? (laughs) And joining me for those stories and much more is Run For God founder, Mitchell Hollis. This might be my favorite podcast to talk about checklists because I know you, I'm you a checklist nerd you are and you're not and I'm not no no well I am sometimes it depends on the depends on the application yeah. I don't like checklists for the checklist but so we were just talking before we come on the air today is September 26th the the hurricane coming out of the Gulf is is landing tomorrow actually my mother-in-law is here uh, they live down in Port St. Joe, which is kind of close to where the ground zero is. But we were just talking about how the Weather Channel and and all the different people hype it up. So they've already yeah. canceled schools for today and tomorrow. And if you're watching, well, you, you can't see out the window right now, but it's it's a nice morning. Yeah. <laughs> and they canceled schools. And it probably will rain, but it's probably not going to be that But it's bad rain. Today. You know? Now, tomorrow, we may get some bad weather tomorrow. Yeah, but. I was just t- talking to a lady uh, with Upward earlier, and I was – talking about how I coached – we coached a triathlon team for 12 years and we never one time canceled practice. And she said, so did you ever have practice in harsh conditions? I said, you bet we did. Regularly. I, I remember one time we wound up on somebody's front porch when we were out on the bike because <laughs> lightning started. But I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings about how quick we are these days to close schools. And I told you they – the Weather Channel, all the weather people have changed from – it used to be – tropical storm and hurricane now it's tropical cyclone yeah and hurricane so they had to inject some more drama into an already drama filled season um yeah well you know what i'm afraid of with all of this weather talk and things like that and the way we respond to weather and things that are upcoming when something really bad does happen or is coming well that too gonna be like chicken little you know but i think we're conditioning our minds to think that we should never we should never do anything hard. If it's going to be uncomfortable, then we should just take the easy road. You right. know what I mean? And we talk about that all the time. That, yeah. that you know, just running in general sure. uh, is is anti that. Now, I get there's an element of safety here. Sure. But I think sometimes nowadays it's... It's overboard. A little bit safety and a lot of drama. Yeah. And... Um, yeah. Yeah, well. I don't know. I'm a, Of course, it is supposed to come through here tomorrow morning and we may get some high winds. So, you know, I don't know. We'll see. I had a lady last night that was supposed to be on one of the coaches calls and she emailed me earlier in the day and said she had just lost power. She's kind of southern uh, part of Florida. Yeah. And they had already lost power. Yeah. So um yeah, prayers for everybody that's in the in the wake of that thing. Amen. Um, well, our post of the week this week comes from Christine Morrison. She said, Four miles down in half marathon training. I'm so far behind. Another bout with bronchitis and just busyness and work. Please pray that I can get as much training in as possible to run healthy and strong in November. Thanks. I thought this was a good time to remind everybody that we can't make up for lost workouts. Now, that's not what Christine was saying. She was not saying she was going to do that. But that's sometimes that is a temptation, right? When they use words like, I'm so far behind, that kind of indicates that there's going to be some catch up and, and you can't do that. Yep. And, you know, this is the time of year when that happens the most, because what happens is we have a hard time keeping up with things in the summer mm-hmm. because it's so uncomfortable and so hard. And we're just more tired in the summer in general, I think, mm-hmm. because of the heat and just battling with the heat. So this time of year, we get to feeling better. It gets to feeling easier to run. And mm-hmm. so now we're going to make up for all that lost time. And it's just a terrible, terrible thing to do. So um, sure. 
especially harder workouts. You know, when you talk about like track work and things like that, you know, most of our plans have two hard days a week. Mm-hmm. But if you have two hard days a week, you cannot add a third because you will not recover, right. period. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And, you know, here's the other thing, too, that happens a lot of times this time of year is, and this has happened to me a bunch of times, where the weather starts getting better and I feel pretty good. I go out and I run. I feel pretty good. And so – I run a little harder than I should. Yeah. And then the next day, it's still nice. I yeah. go out and I run a little harder than I should. Yeah. And I do that for a week. And for a week, I feel great. And I'm yeah. like, man, I feel so good. And then, boom, yeah. it hits you. And now it takes you another week or two to get over what you just did to yourself. It's very similar to sleep. Yeah, it is. You can you can get less sleep. We're, we're going in the opposite direction. You can get less sleep for one night, maybe even two nights. But after a few nights of consistently not getting enough sleep it it runs over you like a truck yep and uh, you just can't you can't that's not sustainable and it's the same way with trying to do too much and running you you might get away with it for a little bit but it's going to catch up to you absolutely so just a reminder when it's time to run easy run easy when it's time to run hard run hard you we, we know that most people run too easy or don't run easy enough on their easy days and don't run hard enough on their hard days so um just a, a friendly reminder. We're going to try this. We got the, we've got a run of the week this week. This comes from Amber Heard. Amber Heard. Amber. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Amber. Amber Ward. <laughs> um, she ran a 10 miler. Yeah. And her splits on that 10 miler were so good. And I just wanted to point this out. So she runs this 10 mile. She runs the first mile in 1058. And that was her slowest mile. Yeah. And every mile from one through eight was under, it was mostly around 10 and a half minutes or better. Um, She gets a little faster in the seventh mile, but then in miles nine and 10, she runs 956 and 859 for the last mile. So Mm -hmm. sounds like it was a pretty well-paced run. And so congratulations to to Amber. Well, if you notice, it was a little over 10 miles. And on that last little stretch, she kicked it on down to... Almost breaking the eight minute barrier. Yes, she did. So you can tell she she had a rabbit in front of her on that last quarter mile or so. <laughs> she went after it there. Yeah. yeah. Now I will say this: when you finish a minute faster on your last run, you may have not run hard enough for the other miles. If you're trying to maximize and run your fastest race, right. now she may not have that may not have been her goal, but uh, but it was well done, very well done. So it's always good to see negative splits, and this one was definitely a negative split from first half to second half. So let's park right here just a second, and, and Amber is a great segue. I, I have a phone call today with Amber um, mm-hmm. to talk about the new church model. So you've heard me pound this drum, and I'm going to continue to pound this drum. I bet I've met with no less than 45, 50 people now about the 5K Challenge church model that's coming back that – Uh, Many people are starting on January the 13th of this coming year. Um, I actually was in Spartanburg for the past two days. And man, Dean, you should have been there. I've got, I really got to see behind the curtain now. I've I've really got to see all the systems and logistics and we were making plans. All the books are about to go off to be published right now. I'm jealous. And so there's, there's so many moving parts. I was talking to Kevin Drake, the president of Upward and, He's like, what's what's got you worried? And I said, there's just so many moving parts that are coming together at one time. But the beauty of of being with Upward now is it's it's an entire departments that are working on these things that are yeah. coming together. In the old days, it was me, you, Holly, Gay, and Angie, and yep. we were trying to pull all this <laughs> on our own, and it was just so overwhelming. Yeah. So I'm feeling that a little bit, but we have entire teams that are pulling all this stuff together and it's going to be launching um, end of October, 1st of November. But with that said, again, if you think that you want to coach a 5K challenge in January in your community, first of all, we want you to do that. I want 100 classes starting in January, but I also want to talk to you. So if that is you and you haven't already sent an email to customer service at runforgod.com, Log off right now, go to your email and send an email and say, hey, Mitchell mentioned that he would like to talk to me uh, on the podcast and I will respond right back to you and we'll get that set up. I've got my one o'clock call. I think there's eight eight or nine coaches going to be on there. 
Um, and so I'm taking them in small groups right now and they've been really great conversations. It's, it's really cool to connect with all these people again, who, you know, they kind of went into run club and we didn't know them as coaches for a few years during COVID. Well, now they're all emerging back yeah. and we're like, Oh yeah, yeah, you were a coach. And, uh, and then we got a lot of new coaches coming in too. So shoot us a message, customer service at run And I will follow up and get a call schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. Do it. Our trivia question from last week. There was a woman who cheated in the Boston Marathon back in 1980. What was her name? Pretty simple, straightforward one. This is, of course, a lot of people know this name, Rosie Ruiz. And the reason why we know that name is because when somebody uh, cuts a course, like in a race or something, that's what we call them. We call them a Rosie Ruiz. Really? <laughs> yeah. See, I, I, Have you never heard I that? had never heard her name. No, uh, no really? Mm-mm. Oh, wow. No. I mean, this was a big, big deal. Of course, this really? is back in 1980. So, yeah. uh, but it it was um, uh, she she got what, apparently what she did was she took the subway <laughs> from the start to somewhere near the finish, and then about half mile from the finish line, we found out later she just came out of the crowd and got on the on the road and started running, and um, she didn't realize it. She thought she was timing it about right, but she she got out there too early, and she winds up winning, winning. <laughs> the world record. <laughs> yeah, and, and is I think third fastest time in history at wow. the time. Yeah, um, it was a twenty five minute PR for her at the time. Uh, supposedly, supposedly, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so she was kind of surprised that she won. She didn't. Re- she wasn't trying to do that. She was trying to be a little more low key than that, but she she blew it. Um, and so they asked her, you know, how in the world do you improve by 25 minutes from one race to the other? Um, and she just said, I-, I woke up feeling good this morning. <laughs> Don't we all wish we could wake up feeling that good? <laughs> anyway, everybody immediately knew something was up. She wasn't sweating as much as she should have been. Um, there were running terms like intervals and things like that she didn't understand. Uh, and and she just didn't look like a runner. She looked, I mean, her legs weren't real well defined like a typical runner, especially an elite runner. Um, anyway, it took her about eight. It took them about eight days to finally disqualify her. Um, and then they found out that the qualifying time she got in with was actually from the New York City Marathon, where she had cheated <laughs> in the New York City Marathon and used the subway there as well. Um, and not only did she cheat, but she got into that race late. She got into the race late by telling them that she was dying of brain cancer. That she got the this woman exception. Had a lot of problems, but yes. Oh my goodness. Um, so how and, did they find out that she took the sub? Did she finally just spill the beans? And no, no, she never admitted it. Never really? admitted it. Nope, nope. But there were there was a lot of evidence. Um, after the fact, uh, people saw her actually saw her. I was going to say a lot of people in the subway were like, who's this sweaty lady with a bib getting on the subway? What, what is this all about? Well, and once they saw her on television at the yeah. Boston marathon, they realized I remember seeing her on the subway. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, she didn't die until 2019. So she, she hung around for a lot longer. She obviously didn't have brain cancer. She was later convicted of embezzling money for the company she worked for, and then she was involved in some cocaine arrest. And I mean, she's then she the next year she got married, had three kids in in less than three years, and then got divorced. Um, it, it, she had some problems, but apparently once she once you got to around nineteen ninety, we didn't hear a whole lot about her. So, um, hmm. so apparently, maybe she calmed down, and maybe she had a great life after that. I, I sure. hope so. I yeah. really do. I just don't understand why people want to cheat. Yeah. I understand embellishment. You know, mm-hmm. people who, you know, the fish was this big. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I understand that. But cheating, yeah. I don't, I, I just don't understand. Um, doesn't make any sense. And she was a college graduate. It's not like she was just, you know, it's not like she had some mental disorder. Maybe. Caused Maybe her to be she that was way. a college graduate. <laughs> she got a, you got a good point there. <laughs> Uh, The most amazing thing to me about this story in context of where we are today is that she she became famous, kind of infamous rather than famous, right? If somebody did that today and got away with it for eight days today, that person would be, would, would write a book that that 
Right? Yeah. They would become rich yeah. off off of that off of that thing that they did that was bad because yeah. we see that happen all the time these days. But back then, that I guess people didn't didn't go for that thing. They really saw that as you're a ter- you're just not a good person yeah. if you do stuff like that. But yeah. we've we've changed. Um, anyway, she was born in Cuba, moved to Florida in 1962 when she was eight years old. Um, there is no word to whether she ever accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior, which is the most important question. Sure. And I hope that during those quiet years up before 2019 that she did. Mm. Mm. Upward Sports equips churches to run self-sustaining sports ministries in their communities. Whether you're a sports fanatic or on staff at a church, Upward Sports will give you all the tools you need to run a first-class sports ministry that allows you to reach families in your community. Upward Sports offers basketball, soccer, flag football, cheerleading, volleyball, baseball, and softball through league and camp offerings. At Upward Sports, we want to help your church make a difference and give you increased opportunities to share the gospel. Learn more today at Upward.org. That's Upward.org. Funny story from yesterday. So, you know, I work with the sound at, at our church mm-hmm. and so yesterday we were I, and what i do is I, put, I display the lyrics and stuff on the screens and things like that and so um they started the the our choir director sang a, a new song that i hadn't heard before and um of course i didn't have the lyrics for it and so um i said well i said well, what's the name of that song and he told me and so i i, I sat down i started to type it type in that song so i could find the lyrics for it and somebody else said, you're not going to find the lyrics for that. And I was like, what do you mean? Well, because he wrote that himself. <laughs> really? And the song was good enough yeah. that I thought it was a commercial song. Really? But it was one that he wrote. So, wow. uh, was, yeah. But so they got me. They laughed at me pretty good. And, and I deserved <laughs> it. It was good. <laughs> well, we talked about this once before. There's a sport called joggling. Mm. And, um, well, I don't know if it's a sport or, but it's juggling while you run. Right. Um, and a lot of the records come from Canada. I'm not sure why it's, it's a little more popular in Canada than the United States. Anyway, another Canadian just tried to break the half marathon record. Um, and he ran one seventeen forty nine while juggling. Now, if you're at home and you're wondering what pace that is, that's under six minutes a mile for uh for a half marathon he missed it but he missed the record by 40 seconds so the record is 11709 amazingly enough um he dropped the balls only dropped the balls three times during this run he said it cost him about 15 seconds he thought um so and he recently just missed the marathon world record by two minutes so he said this he said uh i felt kind of off with my rhythm the whole way i had heard I had a hard time just zoning out and letting time pass. A headwind on the way back eventually broke me. Um, Doran is his name. I'm not sure if that's how you say his name or not. Wrote on Instagram. Uh, despite falling short of his goal, he remains optimistic and motivated, expressing his confidence that he will be able to grow from the experience. He said he was much more devastated when he missed the marathon joggling world record by two minutes in the spring. The Guinness World Record for the fastest joggling marathon is 250. So um, so I've got a trivia question for you. Okay. Because it's weird that you brought this, you brought joggling back up. But I just saw on the news the other day, and I, I'm going to say this would be the fastest person in the world who is also an accomplished juggler. So if they if they did the joggling... I'm assuming they would be the fastest joggler in the world. Yeah. Can you guess who it is? Who do you think is the fastest person in the world who is also an accomplished juggler? Man, this is a great trivia question. It is a good trivia question. Inga Britson. No, Sydney McLaughlin. And oh, McLaughlin? I had heard that. Yes. McLaughlin, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she was on, I think it was Today Show or something the other day. And she was juggling. She said she can do the pins, the balls. I mean, she very good. And I thought, 
man, she needs to do a joggling. Yeah. Try to do a joggling Especially 400 those, record. Yeah, those shorter ones. Yeah. yeah. That would, that'd, be, that'd be cool to have the yeah. women's world record. But she was, I mean, she was sitting there having a conversation and just yeah. juggling away. Ah, yeah. That's pretty cool. Did not know that. Well, I, I think I could. I, they don't have. I looked for like um, age group world records for this. <laughs> they don't have those. I was hoping there was such a thing. Well, Maybe could I could create one. Yeah, I could. Uh, I could get the the age group record for uh, for one of these. I, I I I watched a video of him doing this, and it, it's it's pretty rhythmic. It, it looks like that once you start doing it, it's really not that difficult to yeah. do. So um, if you, you know, if you juggle it all. I was going to say, it would be for me. <laughs> uh, but pretty cool. Well, you like routine and checklists. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out Rhonda Williams does too. Mm -hmm. And she explains why in this story called The Monster Under the Bed. As a little kid, I was afraid there was a monster under my bed at night. Once my parents tucked me in for the night, I pulled the covers up and was careful not to let my legs drape over the edge lest the creature grab my ankle. Apparently, the monster was confined to the space under the bed, so as long as I stayed tucked under the covers, I was safe. How silly. Being afraid of monsters isn't confined to just the human world. My little dog has a nightly routine she completes without fail. On our way to the bedroom to settle in for the night, she checks under the couch as we pass through the family room. Then she looks in the bathtub as if I wouldn't notice an intruder hiding in my tub. Don't forget to look under the bed, I remind her, and she dutifully runs over to the bed and looks underneath. She can't relax until all her checks are complete. No monsters, Mom. We can go to bed now. Even as an adult, I have been afraid of monsters. I run in the early morning hours before the sun comes up. I love watching God paint a beautiful sunrise on his heavenly canvas, but there was a time when I was too afraid to run in the dark alone. As long as I was with someone, I was fine, but running alone made me nervous. Then I realized someone is always with me, the Holy Spirit. So now I run to the sunrise, pray, praying and praising God. Always wear a chest light when I run in the dark so I can see what's ahead and so drivers and cyclists can see me. I take my cell phone with me just in case I run into a monster of some sort, such as a uh, such as turning an ankle and needy, need help. Just like my little dog, I have a nightly routine too. I check to make sure all the exterior doors are locked, turn on the porch light and make sure that, yes, I actually did turn the stove off. Turning on the porch light and looking and locking the doors is a deterrent for would-be thieves or monsters, and leaving the stove on overnight could lead to a fire, an even bigger monster. This checklist has become such a habit that I rarely forget, but when I do, I head back downstairs to get it done. I know that if I don't carry out my checklist, I will lie in bed staring at the ceiling, wondering what if, instead of drifting off to a peaceful sleep. I wonder if that's what my little dog is thinking too. A morning checklist can help us prepare for the monsters lurking in our day. A spiritual routine performed first thing in the morning will shift our focus to God and away from our fears and doubts. Reading the Bible along with time spent in prayer will give us strength and encouragement so we can step into our day with confidence. Proverbs 4.27 says, Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Fixing our eyes on Jesus first thing will keep us on the right path and we will be less vulnerable to the distractions and temptations of our culture. Just as I covered myself with the quilt on my bed for protection before going to sleep as a child, I cover myself with the word of God before going out into the world. Steps to Creating a Spiritual Checklist It's helpful to write out a list and place it where you'll see it every morning. Use the list to remind yourself of what you decided you want to do. Eventually, it will become a habit, and a written list will no longer be needed. A few items to include on the list. Number one, prayer. Express thankfulness, confess sins, and ask for forgiveness. Ask God to help you to focus on Jesus throughout your day. Number two, read a devotion or Bible study. Number three, read scripture. Number four, meditate. Perhaps meditate on how to incorporate the strict scripture passage and or the devotion into your daily life. And then number five, journal. What have you learned? How is God speaking to you? 
Beginning the day with Jesus gives us strength, encouragement, and confidence we need to face the day. A heart full of Jesus means a heart full of peace. A heart full of peace leaves no room for fear. When my feet hit the floor every morning, I want the monster under my bed to say, oh crap, she's up. (laughs) It's a great story, Rhonda. So are you one of those people that I do exactly what Rhonda does at night? I go around, check all the doors, make sure the lights are off and on, What which ones need to be. I have the same lights on in my house every night. It's just a routine. Do you have that same sort? De- of- Debbie does it. So Debbie's the routine person yeah. in your house. I yeah. got you. Yeah. She does all that stuff. Now, I will check to make sure the garage is closed mm-hmm. um, if I think she might not have gotten to it. But So if you're lying in the bed and you realize you didn't check to see if the garage is closed, will you get out of bed to go check? No. Really? No. See, I wouldn't be able to go to sleep. I'd be like, yeah, nothing's coming in at night. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm right there with you, Rhonda. I do remember. I remember one time, talk about getting up and doing things in the dark. I remember one time when I was living in South Georgia and I wanted to ride my bike to Atlanta, which was over 100 miles at the time. And um, I got up at like. 5.30 in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, or something early to get a, a good early start. And um, I got out and I, I rode about a mile. And then I heard dogs, dogs I could not see. Yeah. And I realized this is a bad idea. I turned around and went home, waited for the sun to start coming up, and then I went. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it can be scary, especially on a bike. Yeah. I don't know if I, I haven't, I don't think I told you this. My old coach, Coach Westbrook, mm-hmm. he had, he had a, some dogs that ran out. He was riding his bike and some dogs ran out and he had a crash, broke his mm-hmm. kneecap. Oh, wow. Yeah. He hasn't lost his streak. He's still yeah. running. He's only running a mile a day right now, but he's. Oh, running. so this was recent? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, this just happened. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he's still running a mile a day right now. Whew. He said his longest day last week was a mile and a quarter. So, uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Yeah. I was bragging to him. I said, um, you know, I had run. I, I, it looks like I may get in five thousand kilometers this year, which would be my my highest mileage, which is thirty one hundred miles mm-hmm. for the year. And I, I was really, and I'm I'm proud of that. I mean, that's running your highest mileage at fifty nine years old is great. And he said, "Oh man, I'm so far behind my mileage." And I said, "Because I've never asked him before." So what what was your goal for the year? Six thousand five hundred miles. <laughs> Six thousand miles. Wow. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, anyway, he doesn't share that because he's he's pretty. He, he doesn't keeps, share much. At he all. does. He doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't. But uh, but wow, I knew he ran a lot of miles. But that's that is way over a hundred miles a week. I can't believe average. that's not a question you you didn't ask him on the podcast when you had him on. Yeah, that wasn't a question you asked, was it? No, I don't guess so. Hmm. Yeah. Well, anyway, scripture. Psalm one forty three eight. Let me hear in the morning, or of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Hmm. What I found interesting about this particular psalm is that in in, in the Bible that I was reading, um, it called this prayer for deliverance from enemies. Right. And so it, that's what we all want. Right. And of course, David is, is praying for deliverance from Saul, who's who's after him. Um, but when I say enemies, I'm not talking about a, this tall guy who's who's coming after me. But the enemies that we have are things like complacency. Sure. Right. Complacency. That is an enemy. That mm-hmm. is something that we want to. Um, it, it's the enemy to us get in better shape. It's the enemy to it just makes us want to take the easier road. But if we start every day with God. And we ask God to help us with that particular monster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, then I, I think it's, and if that's what we what we truly desire, and we know that's what God wants us to do, um, then, then God will God will help us with that. I believe He'll make a way. Of course, complacency is just one thing. You may have a different thing. You know, um, it, whatever it is, whatever that thing is. And a lot of those things are not necessarily running or walking related. They're related to to something else in your life. Um, yeah, it's important to. Yeah, it's it's important to note here that David kind of puts the the onus on himself. You know, so many times we we use phrases mm-hmm. like "Where are you, God?" Well, God's answer is pretty simple. I'm I'm right here. I'm where I've always been. Mm-hmm. You know, David saying, "Let me hear you in the morning." It's like when I pray. A lot of times, 
I, I ask for God to help me stay close to him. Yeah. You know, God never drifts. Yeah. We, we can always hear God if we choose to hear him, but yeah, I mean, I, I like how the way he phrases it here. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, because really that's a choice mm-hmm. whether we're hearing from God or not, because, and that's why I've always said, you know, conviction is so comforting. Quick and swift conviction means that we're right there. He's always there. Yeah. We tend to drift back and forth and the closer we are, the better we hear him and, and, the quicker what he is saying to us is heard. Yeah, that's a fine distinction, but an important one. Yeah. Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I, I don't know what version that is. I have never seen that version. It, no. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer. Usually it's author, the author and perfecter of our faith. But I love the word pioneer there. And yeah. I'm, I'm just seeing this because think about what Jesus did. He really was a pioneer of his day. He, he did the ultimate test of faith, right? He went yeah. to the cross. Yeah. Um, and so, I, yeah, I just I love that that they use that word pioneer. Have you ever seen that version? I have. Pioneer? Yeah. I haven't. I have. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I do. I, you're, you're right. It's a, it's, that's another neat, I, I haven't really paid attention to the fact that that particular word, but I've, I've heard that word in, in that before. Um, yeah. We usually hear, you know, of course, Hebrews 12, one with 12, two. Mm-hmm. So uh, we don't normally pull out, but it's, it's perfect in this situation. Um, yeah, and it, you know, the fixing your eyes on Jesus the first thing in the morning. You know, I mean, I know there there are people, and I guess if you if you prefer your quiet time at night, maybe you're a night person, whatever. It just doesn't seem as a, as good to me, but that's because I like mm-hmm. to do it in the morning. But I, I I also thought I thought why would you want to do that? And then I thought you know what, if if you're going through your day, you know, we we think about how we. We want to meet with God in the morning mm-hmm. and, and start our day off right. But if you don't do that in the morning and you just get started with your day, and but you have it to look forward to at night. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a it's a different thing, but a really positive a great thing way to, to wind the day down. Yeah, to to think about, man, I can't wait to to spend time with him. It reminds me we've talked before about David Hendricks, who who really was instrumental on in the early days of this ministry. He used to always tell me he always he was the minister of music at our church for 30 years. And when his alarm clock would go off in the morning, he would turn it off and he would pray before his feet ever hit the bed. He would lay in the bed and pray before his feet ever hit the ground. And he said that was for him. That was a great way to start. It wasn't really a formal devotion, but it was just. Just opening. Good morning, God, you know, type prayer. And, And he would lay there for two or three minutes and just talk to God and. Um, that's always stuck with me. That's good. Proverbs 4.27 says, Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. I think, you know, I run on the roads a lot. Um, And, and, you know, normally when I'm running on the road, I I stay away from the edge of the road until a car's coming. Mm -hmm. When a car's coming, you know, you move over and you get as close as you can. And you got to be vigilant, Mm -hmm. right? you got to be very careful Mm because all you got to do is step just – Two inches to the left, mm-hmm. and boom, you, you turn an ankle or something like that. So I have to be much, much more cautious then. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, what Solomon is telling his son here um, is that he needs to stay away from the edge of the road. <laughs> you know, um, you, you know, when, when now we're sometimes we don't have any choice but to be close to the edge of the road, just like when I'm running and the car's coming. I don't have a choice. I have to do that. But, um, when I, when the cars aren't coming, especially on our rural roads around here, there's not much traffic. Um, then, then don't, don't run what that far over. Mm-hmm. You know, give yourself a foot or two yeah. of of clearance. Um, so, and that's this goes to everything that we do, right? Just keep yourself away from whatever it takes to keep yourself away from whatever tempts you, mm-hmm. right? It's we talk about, 
you know, the, the Reese's cups, you know, yeah. the easiest way to keep away from those, especially at home is to not have them in the home. Exactly. Right. So keep yourself away. That's an them. ongoing problem for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why I had a different picture here. I kind of snickered when you read it because the picture came to me immediately. Um, and it's, it's, Mine wasn't from the frame of reference of staying away from things. It was the frame of reference of going into what God's leading us into. Yeah. And I had this picture in my head, and it's because it just happened yesterday. But if you've ever had a dog who's an inside dog, like we have Louie. He's an mm-hmm. inside dog. When you take him out and it's raining outside, and Louie gets to the other edge of the porch and you're like, you know, kind of nudging him on the back. You're like, go on. What do they do? They turn to the right, and then they turn to the left. And it's like, no, go straight. It's yeah. wet out there. It's uncomfortable out there. And you kind of give them that nudge, and they finally go out. And I think that's why I snickered, because that's exactly what we do. That's good God's point. saying, right here, it's a straight walk. You don't have to – it's straight, 10 steps this way. And what do we do? Turn to the right, and then we turn to the left, and God's – nudging us on the behind sometimes saying yep. it's right there it's it's going to be uncomfortable you may get wet but it's the right thing to do yeah you know it's a good you won't wet the bed that night you know whatever it is <laughs> um i, I like don't know it. why that that illustration popped in my head i like it though question what are you afraid of <laughs> that's a pretty wide open question right yeah <laughs> you know what scares me the most of, of anything that and maybe it's Maybe part of it right now is because uh, I've got some really close friends who are going through this, but co- cognitive disease, yeah. the, the idea of losing my mind um, <laughs> worse than I already have, uh, you know, that that scares me as much as as much as anything. I can't imagine that I was talking with somebody whose mother is going through this and she was talking about how every once in a while her mother realizes what she's going through Mm -hmm. and she just cries Mm -hmm. and i can imagine Mm -hmm. how that would be so hard to go through to know that you're you're not recognizing people that you that you know Mm -hmm. um would be really tough so that i guess once you get once you get past that and you're just you really don't recognize people it's you don't know so i don't know but the idea of losing my mind just man but you know what the bible says the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God. So even though, even, even though that's, that's a fear that I have, I can take comfort knowing that even if I go through that, like you just said a few minutes ago, God, God's there, mm-hmm. right? And he's going to be there. Um, yeah, I think for me, I, I don't typically fear things that are right in front of me. I, I don't know why that is. I fear things that are way out there that may or may not happen. Yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a, I tend to be a doomsday type. I've, I keep saying the older I get, the more prepper I have in me. I play all these scenarios out in my head. And I guess it comes back to my planning side. You know, I want to be yeah. ready for any scenario so that when the scenario comes, I usually am ready yeah. once it gets here. But in doing that, I planned. For 10 scenarios, nine of which didn't happen. Yeah. And that's exhausting sometimes. Yeah. Um, I mean, just even though we were making fun of the weather, this is what I did yesterday. We were, I think it's ridiculous how overblown the weather is. But guess what I did yesterday? What? I went and got the generators. Uh, I filled every one of my gas tanks up with gas and I got the our little handheld lights down from the attic in case the power goes off. Yeah. And at the same time, I'm saying this ain't gonna happen. This, but I've played it all up in my head. Like we're gonna have trees down everywhere. We're not gonna have power. And if if all that happens, I'm gonna be glad I did what I did. But how much of that is me overreacting? And how much of that is fear? And a lot of it's just it is. It's just fear. I don't. Yeah. I don't want to be back 700 feet off the road with 32 pine trees down with no power and no gas. I, you know. Yeah. It's not like I can, I can't actually walk to the road you know, yeah. if I need to. Yeah. But it's like in my head, I'm I'm five thousand miles off the road. Yeah. You know, we're gonna have 
one million pine trees down across the driveway <laughs> and I'm going to have to fend for myself for the next three years. That's how it plays up in my head. Yeah. 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 We just make a bigger deal out of things than they are a lot of times. A mountain out of a mohill. That is true. That is true. You know, I remember there was a time when, uh, when it would have scared me um, to not be able to run. Hmm. Like, you know, not not in a not in a terrible terrible way, but just the idea of not running is just so. I mean, it'd be like, what's left to live for? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, that's the way I was at one point. And today, I think if I couldn't run tomorrow, you know, my attitude would be, well, what's God got planned for me instead? You know, and and I could handle it. And I got to thinking about how many days of my life have I run? And you know what? I don't even know if I've run half the days of my life. Right. I've run every day for 13 years except one, and I don't even know if I've run half the days of my life. Does that surprise you when I say that? Yeah, but, until you really start thinking about it. Yeah, when yeah. you start thinking about yeah. it, you realize running's not as big a part as you make it out to be because you t- take the 13 years I've run pretty much every day. Well, the first 14 years of my life, I didn't run at all. Yeah. I mean, I did some running, but I didn't run to run for 14 years. So that thir- this last 13 years just made me break even on 50-50. <laughs> so it really comes down to how, how much did I run between 15 and 40, 40 some, 45. Mm-hmm. And um, did I run half the days? Probably right around that. So I've only run half the days of my life. So I don't know what I'm so worried about. <laughs> do you have a morning routine to get your day started on the right foot? I do. Yeah. I'm a... If you've never seen this video, I encourage everybody to go watch it. But I'm I'm a make your bed type of guy. I can't just like I can't go to sleep if I haven't checked the front door. I can't walk out of my bedroom unless the bed's made. Um, there's a great video. Uh, it was a Navy SEAL commander, uh, and I found out he he's a went to the University of McRaven. Texas. Yeah, McRaven. Yeah. Um, I watched a special on him here a while back, but he talks about. He gave a speech, a commencement speech, a graduation ceremony with, for the University of Texas. And the title of it was Make Your Bed. Yep. And he talks about how those those small wins every day is what sets the tone of your day and ultimately your life. And so for me, and, and we've taught our kids, you know, we've taught all the triathlon kids. It may not be Make Your Bed, but do that one thing every morning, which is a small win. Yeah. And... Cause I have, I've left the house like in a rush before and didn't make my bed. I feel like my whole day was just yeah horrible yeah because I didn't make my bed. Um, so Rhonda, yes, I, I make my bed every morning. I I turn both lamps on on both sides of my bed. The blinds are set <laughs> the same every day. It's that morning routine for me. Yeah. And I don't walk out of my bedroom until all that's done. Yeah, but you know what? We make our bed, but here's the way Debbie and I do it. So I get up before her almost every morning, right? And but it's not very much before her. But I get up, I make some tea, I have my uh, some my, my blueberries and uh, oatmeal, and then I know exactly what time she's going to get up. And so I walk back into the bedroom when she gets up, and we make the bed together. She makes her side, I make my side. <laughs> it's like really? a routine that we do every day. Yeah, yeah, but it's kind of fun. Yeah, to to do that. So and see, I make the bed down at night too. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, Holly, Holly laughs at me so much because, you know, I have to, I fold, even though we're about to get in it, I have to fold it down just right. This is my OCD coming out. I have to fold it down just right, pillow stacked up just right, <laughs> turn the certain lights off. I'm probably giving away too much information <laughs> right now. But yeah, it's those, yeah. it's those things that it kind of sets the tone of your day and ends your day. You know, it's kind of like yeah. starting, starting your day with God and finishing your day with God. It yeah. really sets the tone for your day. Yeah, well, and you know, with today's resources, we don't really have a good excuse not to start our day off well. Right. You know, one of the things that I've done now, this is my my second year of listening to a Bible in the Year podcast every mm-hmm. day. And I do that every day. Mm-hmm. And I, I enjoy it. And it, it you know, I can go downstairs and I can feed fish and I can do, I can do other, some other stuff while I'm doing that. And uh, it's, it's, there's no excuse nowadays sure. not not to do it. So, what does it mean to fix your eyes on Jesus? 
I think it means viewing everything you do through his eyes, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, to become more like Christ uh, to me, to fix our eyes on Jesus means it means more than just seeing him. Um, Here's a running when when I've been lost more times than I like to admit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I remember getting lost in Houston one time. And my problem is, is normally whenever I go and I run in a place that I don't normally run is I look for the tallest thing around the hotel usually, which is usually where we're staying. And I look for some points of reference so that if I do get lost, what, what can I look for that's tall that, that'll point me in the right direction? Well, Houston's really flat. Mm-hmm. There wasn't anything tall enough. And I got lost for a while there. Um, matter of fact, I asked a lady who was walking. This is, I've never seen anybody do this before until then. I still haven't seen anybody since. She was walking and reading hmm. That's dangerous. A, a, an actual book, <laughs> not her phone, yeah. an actual book while she was walking. Yeah, I had never seen that before. Anyway, she, she got me back on my track. But, but my point is, is that a lot of times I've been lost and I look and I go, oh, there's that hotel. Mm-hmm. I remember make, making a mental note when I left. There's that hotel. And I just start snaking my way through the streets to get there. Because a lot of times, boy, Jacksonville, Florida is terrible. There's, there's places where you can be a mile away from something, but you're four miles away, you yeah, know, yeah. running. Kind of like distance. Las Vegas. Or yeah. Las Vegas, something looks a mile away and it's four miles yeah. away. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but you get that reference and you at least start moving in the right direction. I, that's the way I look at jesus is if i start in the morning and he's my point of reference for everything that i do then i'm always going in the right direction sure so yeah and i think it's i think it's more than just that i mean uh, we're going through a uh, a chapter in our sunday school book right now and it it talks about kind of the same question but it's what 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 are the actionable items you mentioned you know having a point of reference i think it's it's putting reminders in front of you every day you know i have a have an alligator on my dash in my truck and we won't go into what that means now, but it's a reminder to, to keep my eyes focused on Jesus, but it's also putting barriers in front of you to keep you away from the places that you don't need to go. Um, and so I think there's some actionable things that we need to do as well as keeping our eyes fixed. It makes it easier for us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, every once in a while we may get lost. Things may not go well, you know, even though we, we, I have that point of reference, I know, I know where I'm headed, mm-hmm. and I may still get lost like I did in Houston, yeah. but I give myself the best chance sure. if I start off with some point of reference at least. Right. And that's the important thing is, is having that frame of reference first thing in the morning. And hopefully you, you, you're on that path. Things are going to come at you. Sure. It's not always going to go great, but at least you, you know what you're aiming for. Sure. Good word, Dean. It is so hard to stay on track as a runner or a walker. The world also makes it difficult to stay on track spiritually, too. For pennies a day, Upward Sports Run for God Run Club can make both of these journeys more fun and much easier. Join the Run for God Run Club and get access to training plans, videos, and the best group of active Christians you will find anywhere. Go to runforgod.com and sign up today. All right, well, how about an update on something we talked about last two weeks? You know, we talked about who would be the best 5K runner of all of our presidents. Um, We gave all of our answers on that question um, last week. Um, But I got this email from Rich Glass, a Run Club member. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and he had this link to this article that was written in 2002, and it was a Runner's World article interviewing George W. Bush. Hmm. Um, and I, this was great. So he, I just wanted to read some quotes from that particular article. Um, there were headlines. There were like these, I guess, questions and then his answers. What running does. He says, first, it helps me sleep at night. Second, it keeps me disciplined. For example, I'm a person who believes in punctuality. That's a discipline. I expect the White House staff to be on time and sharp and and to exercise. In my case, running helps me keep that discipline. Running also breaks up my day and allows me to recharge my batteries. Running also enables me to set goals and push myself toward those goals. In essence, it keeps me young. A good run adds a little bounce to my step. 
I get a certain amount of self-esteem from it. Plus, I just look and feel better. On his current fitness program, I go to work a little before 7 a.m. and I expect everybody to show up on time when I have a meeting. I make time to run or exercise every day. There's never a question in my mind that I'll exercise. Even when I travel, there's always a treadmill in my room. I have a treadmill on Air Force One. On making time to exercise. I believe anyone can make time. As a matter of fact, I don't believe it. I know it. If the President of the United States can make the time, anyone can. Can you believe he said that? As many times as I've said that? Yeah. <laughs> Exercise is so important that corporate America should help its employees make time. There should be a flex time for families and there should be flex time for exercise. A healthy workforce is a more productive workforce. We have to go. We have we have got to do a better job of encouraging exercise in America. So I set my sights on the Houston Marathon, which gave me some more time to train. I ran it in 344. I ran the first mile in 830 and the last mile in 830. It was one of the great experiences of my life. I learned that running can make you feel 10 years younger the day of the race and 10 years older (laughs) the day after the race. That's well put. (laughs) The one on the 100 degree club. It started during the campaign. It was August and well over 100 degrees. We landed in Crawford, and I said that I had to go for a run. I knew if I didn't get it in, then I'd never do it. So, as I recall, there was a change of shift of the Secret Service agents, and I just told them that we should all go for a run right then. So, both shifts of agents went right with me in the heat. And afterward, I had 100 degree club t-shirts and certificates printed up and gave them away to everybody who went with me. That's hilarious. That's wow. pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So, I, I, a treadmill on an airplane. Yeah. That's an interesting concept. Isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I thought that too. I don't know what that, uh, you know, those little dips and everywhere that you get every once in a while. Man, I would love to see his, his garment after, you know. Yeah. 500 miles an hour, you know. <laughs> Did a 5K in 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Well, I didn't realize. I knew he was. I knew he was a runner. I didn't realize how avid he was about it. Um, he said that he would run three miles a day. Well, while, while he was wa- in Washington D.C., he would run more than that when he was outside Washington D.C. And he would run it in twenty thirty to twenty forty five. Typically, that's pretty fast. That's under seven minute pace. Yeah. And um, I think if he could do that, then my prediction of eighteen fifty one, I think it was right in line. I think I. I think I nailed this one. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, so. yeah, and he didn't even talk about the mountain biking. Of course, I bet he didn't do a whole lot of mountain biking while he was president. Yeah, I don't know. I don't so, know. But did he do the marathon while he was president? Uh, I man, that would be a Secret Service nightmare. Yeah, it would, wouldn't it? <laughs> I don't know if he did that then or not. No, 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 no. He did the he did the marathon in 1993. Okay, because he he started training for the marathon because he was a little frustrated mm. that his father didn't win the presidency. So it was in 1993 that he did that. That would be cool for a president to go undercover and run a marathon. Because you know they could pull it off. Yeah. You know, yeah. get a wig or whatever and sign up as an alias and then get to the finish line and then take it all off and say, surprise. Yeah, that'd, that'd, be <laughs> that'd be great. Neat. <laughs> all right. It's a time for Dean's thoughts. That's a time when I share something I've written about the intersection between running and faith. When somebody asks me, how are you? I usually say, just right. But that's not a typical response. Many people respond with, I'm tired. Well, let's talk about that. Hmm. This one's called, I'm too tired. Are you tired? I thought so. Do you know how I know you're tired? Because everyone is tired, or at least that's what most people say. It has become a reflex answer to the question, how are you? When you wake up, You have a full tank, or at least a nearly full tank, of energy. As soon as you get your day started, you begin using that store of energy. It's simply the way the body works. It happens to everybody. There are no exceptions. At some point, you're faced with the question, do I use up all the energy in my tank, or do I save it for something else? Many of us will choose to overprotect that energy instead of burning through it. I'm too tired to run today. It was a tough day at work. But am I too tired? Or do I have some primal instinct to protect the energy I have left? Usually, it's the latter. 
The more insidious excuse is, I don't have enough energy to go for a run. If we're not convincing ourselves we need to preserve energy, we're convincing ourselves that we don't have enough energy. Like we're going to run out of gas in the middle of the running trail and we'll fail to make it home. I don't have to tell you how silly that notion is, yet it persists. But here's the thing. Everyone who has ever done something special has had to go deep into the energy tank. Everyone who has ever completed a marathon has had days of training when they didn't feel like going out for a 10-mile run. And I have never heard any of them say, I wish I had saved my energy for more during energy more during my training. Sometimes they'll even point to one particular day when they had to overcome the desire to save energy and stay home instead of going for that long run. Don't give in. Some days you need to use all the energy in your tank. Do it. It'll be worth it. Imagine how tired Job felt. Every day was worse than yesterday. I don't know about you, but the worse things seem to be going for me, the more tired I feel. Imagine Job. Day after day of pain. Yet every day he got up and decided that this day would be better. He didn't use the excuse that his tank was empty. No matter how bad things got, he found the energy to praise God. And in the end, it made all the difference. There had to be days when he wanted to pack it in and give up, but he didn't. So what are you going to do? Are you going to use the energy you have every day? Or are you going to leave some in the tank just in case you need it for something else? That just in case will rarely come. And even if it does, you'll find the energy you need to get through it. So don't save up. Empty your tank regularly and you'll find out it is worth it. That's a great story, Dean, first of all. And second of all, it it made me think about, um, I know batteries aren't this way anymore, but if you remember the early days Mm -hmm. of like cell phone batteries. Nickel cadmium batteries and yeah. If you didn't, if you didn't use all of the battery, and you just used like half of it and plugged it up, the battery life became less. It it Before you know it, the time that you were plugging it up would be the only time you got it. It actually got less. Running doesn't do that. R- yeah. Running wants you, or fitness, or exercise, the goal is to drain it every day because it not only, it not only stays off that nickel, whatever battery you said, that it gets less every because that's what running would do. If you're just trying to conserve all the time, your energy store is going to become less and less. That's true. And less. Yeah. Not only does your energy store say stagnant if you continue to run, you're you're going all the way to. It makes that gas tank bigger. You know we've we've always we've always said I've there's been runs there's been runs with you where you come in the end of the day and you're just beat. Mm-hmm. And you go for a run and what happens? You feel better. You got more energy all of yep. a sudden. So. Yeah, I hear people say that, and it's it's just not true. Yeah. Running actually, running is kind of like plugging into the wall. It's giving you more energy. Now, sure, you may feel drained, but you're actually increasing that battery size as you're doing it. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, this is a great a great point you made here, Dean. Yeah, you know, it makes me think, and I've I've said told people this before. I don't know. I don't. Do you do you wait till your tank gets pretty low before you fill it up in your vehicle? Me personally, yeah. No, I'm a I'm a half tank guy. See, I don't, I don't let it get. See, that drives me crazy because really? my th- my thoughts are this. My thoughts are I'm going to run it down until at least I get the warning that says you have 50 miles really? left. Really? Yes. I almost never fill it before then. Unless I happen to be at Costco where the gas is cheaper, then I then I fill it up no matter how much I have in there. But I, I feel like if I look at how much time I spend at the gas station versus mm-hmm. how much time you spend at the gas station, mm-hmm. in my lifetime, I'm going to save days of being at the gas station. Yeah, but we look at it different. I look at it that I fill up when it's convenient. You know, I fill up when it's convenient, so I, it gets down near a half tank. If I've got 10 minutes extra, I'll go ahead and stop by the gas station so that I'm never filling up when it's inconvenient because yeah, it never that, fails. That's a good point. The light comes on the day before, and then the next morning you're running late, and you got, and then you're having to stop at the gas station, and so you're late for whatever. So that's that's the way I look at it. But I see the way you look at it. Yeah. We're, I, you're saying we're wasting time. I'm saying I'm using time that was going to be wasted. 
Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't so. thought. I hadn't. I never thought about it from that standpoint. That's funny, isn't it? Well, I've never been in that situation where I, w- I was late for something because I had to stop and get gas. So, really? Yeah, I don't ever recall that happening in forty years of driving yeah. that that ever happened. So, it's one of those things being prepared for something that's not going to happen. Well, how many times have you sweated bullets? I can remember one time in particular oh. with I was pulling a fifth wheel camper through Atlanta. I didn't stop when I should have and got gas and I'm coming through Atlanta and it's a diesel truck. So not everybody has diesel. My light comes on. I'm in downtown traffic, Atlanta. You can't just whip a 60 foot rig in somewhere. Yeah. And I never want to be put in that position either. That's a good point. Yeah. There are times. How many times have you sweated bullets thinking I'm going to run out of gas? Only once. (laughs) Really? Yeah. One time I remember because of me and my brother and my father, we're hanging out. We were in the North Carolina mountains, and I thought I had plenty of gas. And we we went out somewhere, and we on our way back, it was getting really low. And I thought I'll just stop for gas. There were no gas stations. I mean, yeah. there were no gas stations. Yeah. And then we started going up a mountain. Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna run out of gas. And I was, I got worried. And we we finally we finally found a. Well, I don't see how the people who drive the EVs now do it. Oh, I, I would know. be a nervous wreck all yeah. the time because. You can't just whip it into any gas station and charge your car up. There's that's, Those that's are true. really few and far in between right now. Yep, yep, um, yep. Well, <clears throat> but the idea here, of course, is that we have more energy than we ever give ourselves credit for. I mentioned the idea of, you know, we act like I don't have enough energy to go for a run. We act like we're going to we're going to be like one of those EVs. <laughs> we're going to go out for a run and we're going to just be stranded. Yeah. Because I can't get home because I don't have the energy. No, you got the energy. You'll find the energy. Yeah. You'll you'll figure out how to make it work. And to give you more energy for the next day. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So it's important. Um, yeah. And a lot of times. um the problem with our energy level is just our attitude. Sure. Right. Uh, you know, when we have that woe is me attitude, we're going to feel more tired. We're going to feel like we have less energy. And there's something about George Bush said it. George W. Bush said it. He, he sleeps better. There is something about whether it's running or it's working. You know, I'll do this out in the yard. I'll just I'll go and go and go and go and go. To where I'm absolute, I, there's nothing better than laying down at night, absolutely drained. I totally agree. I mean, it's so it's so rewarding mentally, a deep sleep. But physically, you sleep better than you've ever slept before, yeah. and you can only do that when you really drain that tank. That is true. That is true. Now, some people will say it's not healthy to drain your tank too much. And there may be some truth to that if you did it for too long, too many days in a row. There's but a recovery period, but it's like a long run. You, you don't need to do a long run every day. Right. Every now and then, drain that tank. Yeah, I think every now and then you you got to do it. So so let me challenge you out there. If you're listening, don't use the phrase. The next time somebody asks you, how are you? Don't use the phrase. If you're one of those who does that regularly, don't use that phrase. Don't say, I'm tired. Instead, find something else to say. You know me. Yeah. When somebody asks me, they ask me, how are you? I say, I'm just right. Yeah. And sometimes I'm not just right. <laughs> yeah. But I say it, it comes out of my mouth, and it it lifts me up a little yeah. bit. You, you, lis- you listen to yourself. Yeah. We all listen to our own words. Yep. And if we say we're tired, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're yep. going to feel tired all the time. Yep. yep. So if you're skeptical of that, Try this. Try that. Try not saying I'm tired. Try fi- some some positive phrase and start making that a habit. And tell me if you don't feel better. Same thing with smiling. Yeah, you can you can lie yourself into feeling better. It's true. Put a smile on your face, and you will feel better. Amen. There is no better way to start the day than in the Word. Our Bible in a Year Challenge is a great way to start the day in the Word as I read through the entire Bible in 365 episodes. I also share running and walking tips each day as well as encouraging quotes. Choose the self-paced challenge so that you can go at your pace. You must be a Run Club member for access to this exciting challenge. So, if you're not a member, sign up today and get started. If you are a member, what are you waiting for?
Every week I share a reason why running and or walking are so awesome. And here's this week. I say that it helps with your scheduling and organization. We were just talking about that, right? Well, if you're going to be a runner or a walker, then you got to find time to do it. And we all have these crazy busy lives these days, and it can be tough to find time. But runners and walkers usually find the time. Just like George W. Bush said, don't give me you can't find time. You can. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so if you're a runner or walker, you, you have to be a little more organized to be able to get that in, um, at least if you're dedicated to it. Um, so it forces you to get creative. It makes you realize you can often do more than you think you can do. Well, and I've said, you know, when people talk about I can't find time to do it, I said you you find you find time to go to that ball game. You find time to watch that Netflix series. You find, and it's because mentally you 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 categor- And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with watching TV or going to a ball game or whatever, but mentally you some people do it physically. They physically put it in a calendar. Or at minimum, they're mentally putting these things into time slots in their day. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of people, they don't do that with exercise. They're like, I'm just going to find time to fit it in. You will never fit it in consistently (laughs) if that's the way you look at exercise. True. You have to catalog it into your calendar every day. Some people, I've I've told them if you struggle with this, physically, everybody has a calendar on their phone nowadays. Yeah. Sit down on Sunday night and say – when exactly, if you're doing the 5K challenge, when exactly am I going to get those three 30-minute runs in? It's 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. It's 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 less than most TV shows nowadays. Yep. You can get that in. For sure. Physically put it in your calendar and and make yourself adhere to that. And just like you were talking about with the, the list or whatever earlier, eventually you won't have to do that. That's right. Because you'll, you'll create that pattern, those those grooves in your brain that's, this is my exercise time groove. It's important, and I'm going to catalog that into my day. Yep. And you'll be successful if you do that. And don't let yourself skip that meeting. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unless something comes up, of course, but you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. But just like what do we do with a meeting if, if one meeting runs over? We reschedule it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Well, here's a crazy story that I absolutely love. Shannon Roberry, she is a 1,500-meter runner from the United States. Um, and back in 2012 in the Olympics, she got she took sixth place in the Olympic finals 1500 meter run. And you say, oh, well, so what? Well, some people have called this particular race the dirtiest race in history. And she just found out 12 years after that race that she is now considered the bronze medalist in that race. Of the top nine ladies in that race, six have been found to have been cheating or doping. Um, and they've moved her up to third place. How cool is that? Would that be cool to? That so be, they officially moved her up. Yes, wow. She is offic- in the official results. She is shown as third place now. I wonder yeah. if they sent her a medal. She didn't know. I, I saw an interview with her, mm-hmm. and she doesn't know how that's going to work. But she, you know, she's she's hoping that that's what's going to happen. So um, I can't imagine running so hard and training so hard. And working your whole life around this goal that you have and then knowing the people that ultimately beat you are just cheating to do it. I just can't imagine how hard how, how hard that would hurt. Mm. You know, if I know somebody's cheating to beat me, it's that's that's demoralizing, mm-hmm. you know, if you're doing everything right and everything you can do. But how do you think we should how do you think we should Handle, not handle. How do you think people who cheat should be treated? The reason I ask this because I I see both sides. You, you mentioned Lance Armstrong on that in your notes. Mm-hmm. I have a very different um, attitude toward Lance Armstrong. Not that I know him personally, but Lance was very destructive with his cheating. I mean, he he ruined people's lives. He yeah. bankrupted people. And even after he came out, there was no remorse. There was no sorrow. If you watch his 30 for 30 in the in the interview with Oprah, it was just he's – even to the day, he's just a vile person. So I look at him differently. And then there's a young man named Colin Cartier um, who was a triathlete. Mm-hmm. And he's he was actually on one of Lane's teams um, 
when he was younger and it came out, he got caught for cheating and he basically said, I'm sorry, I was wrong. He left the sport and even today I, I follow him on social media and he's, he's no longer in the sport and he, but he's doing other sports now and cycling, nothing competitive and he'll, he'll post something and people just still are piling on him. It's been a year and a half or two years now. And they're just, you're a cheater. You're in, and cheating is, is no different than the bad things you or I have done. That's, that's and funny. if you have remorse, you've said, I'm sorry. We have to forgive these people. We yeah. have to give them grace. And, but for some reason, cheating sparks something in us that's more visceral towards people. And I don't know why that is. Yeah. I, you know, I, if, if, if I know, I mean, when people cheat on a spouse for years after that, you don't hear people still attacking them for that. Yeah, that's true. We, we, we move on. They, they repented. They said, I'm sorry. You know, they got a divorce. It was whatever. But for some reason in the, when the realm of cheating, even with the lady that you talked about, mm -hmm. even in, even today, we still, you said we still use the term, her name, when referring to cheaters. Why do we elevate cheating to something, to this, like this cardinal sin? I guess it's, it's just the, the intentionality of cheating. You know, it's yeah. a long planned out thing. It's one thing to do something impulsive, you yeah. know, I get, I get impulses and, but the idea of planning out cheating, I think, yeah. I think is, is bad. And yeah, the truth is, is our culture today allows so much dishonesty mm -hmm. in so many ways that, yeah, why is cheating still held out to be this big deal? I do believe that we have got to forgive people for mistakes they right. make, period. Yeah. I hate it. Hate it. And I don't care which side it's on. In politics, where somebody brings up some something somebody did or said twenty years ago, yeah, that drives me crazy because it's like that was twenty years ago, and and in a lot of cases, that person is clearly not that person today. Sure, and and we're going to want to hold something against them. They did twenty, and and I just that turns my stomach. And yeah. I think it's the same way with with cheating. I think if you cheat. I think that what what that guy did. Colin was, paid the price. I mean, he, he paid the price, and he came out and he said, and you could tell he had he regretted it. Yeah. Did you? I mean, you've probably you probably read the statement he gave back when he when he came out. I mean, it was very. I mean, and and some people say, "Well, you're only doing this because you got caught." Well, yeah, yes. But he got caught, and he the the response to getting caught for Lance and him was very different. Yeah. <laughs> response yeah. and i don't know i just i feel bad for the guy yeah that yes he cheated he there is no excuse for what happened but to keep piling on him all this time later it's just it's out of I, line it feels yeah. like to me yeah i don't like that i don't yeah. like that at all never have you know i thought about this i thought you know at, at my age i'll be 60 next year if i took performance enhancing drugs mm-hmm for the next year, I could literally be probably. I might be. I might be. I might be able to be the best in the world mm -hmm. in sixty year olds. I don't know. I, I'd be. I'm close. Sure. Right. But the idea of cheating, just. I mean, it's yeah. like no, no. Yeah. I don't care. Even if you told me you could get, but we we know you can get by with it. Would mm -hmm. I? Do? I. It's like no, yeah. no. If nobody, if I knew nobody would find out, and I still am like. I can't. And why? And why is that? Because I think for us mm -hmm. as Christians, we know there's somebody else watching. Sure. And so we we've got to be. I think we got to be on guard even more mm -hmm. than other people do. But anyway, that's just one of those things. Well, we have a uh, half marathon coming up in Wynn, Arkansas. Um, hopefully. Um, there, there's still time, I think, to register for that if you haven't done that. And if you can meet us out there in Wynn, Arkansas on November the 3rd, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, yeah. Um, and you're going to run that one, right? I'm going to run it. Yeah. It should be fun. We'll get together. We'll, we'll do some stuff. Uh, looks like that town suffered a, a tornado last year. 
Oh, wow. And um, they're still trying to recover from it. I mean, it destroyed the school there, the high school there. Really? And um, yeah. And so it's great. It's great to support that community. And um, so come on out and join us in Wynn, Arkansas. So we're going to hit the 100 churches in January again. So for the person out there, Dean, who's saying, I'm just, I'm, I'm not good in front of people. I don't know if I, that seems really uncomfortable to lead a 5K challenge in my community. What would you say to that person? I'd say do it anyway, because what you're going to find out, it's, a lot, it's like the energy thing, right? Mm-hmm. It's, you think you can't do it. You sure. think you don't have the energy. You think you'll be embarrassed. You think you can't do it. But once you get up there and you actually do it, You'll be so glad you did. So mm-hmm. glad. We've heard it a, a hundred times from people that said, I didn't want to do it, but I just felt like God wanted me to do it, and I did it, and I'm so glad I did it. So let me explain what happens the very first night. So you're going to, you're going to, we're going to onboard you as a church. You're going to plan. You're going to get some help, and you're going to come into that first night. And the moment that is the most scary, if you're not good in front of people or you're not a public speaker or you just feel completely out of your element, the scariest point is when you get up in front of the class for that first time. Mm -hmm. I know this because I did it back in 2010. I was not a teacher. I was not a public speaker. I was completely out of my element. And I did this organically that first year. It just came out of me. But it's the same thing that we ask everybody to do the first night. And what happens is the moment you get up in front of that first class, we direct you to ask a simple question to the class. Why are you here? And Dean, what that does is it takes it, takes it off of you at that mm-hmm. point because the class is not about you, right? Yep. I think this is what – this is where runners – it you. This course produces a change in runners that is much needed. Yeah. You know, I, not not saying we as runners are all conceited, but this sport is a pretty selfish sport. And so before you taught your first class, it was it wasn't anything um malicious that you were doing. You just you were worried about your times and all this stuff. And and so was I. You know, mm-hmm. I wasn't near as fast as you, but we all still want to hit our PRs. Well, what you do that first night when you stand up and you ask that simple question is you take the focus off of you and you put it on your class. And that first class, the stories that I heard over the next, I I had allowed like five minutes (laughs) for that question. And I think it went on for, I don't remember how long it went on. It went on a long time. You start to hear the, the reasons why people are there. And in a moment, it changes your perspective and you realize you're not leading this class. You're part of this class. You you instantly become part of a community of people that you may thought you were already a community of. These are people in your church, but it goes much deeper real quick because you're going to hear about the gentleman who's overweight and can't get around as, as good as he once could. And, wants to be there for his grandkids. You're going to hear the husband and wife talk about their marriage is hanging on by a string and they just need purpose and they need to get off that hamster wheel of life. You start to hear all these stories that lets you know, this is why I'm here doing this. And mm-hmm. I want everybody listening to this podcast to experience it. And that's why I'm unashamed to get on here every week and say, you need to teach this class. It's not because I'm trying to sell something. Well, I am. I am trying to sell something, but it's not a product. It's hope, and it's a changed life, and it's a new perspective on this sport that I want everybody to experience because I know how valuable it is. Amen. Well put. Well, our trivia question for this week um, is a little different. I'm not going to ask a trivia question. I'm going to ask a question that will require you to share your opinion. I don't think we've ever done that before. So tell me who your favorite runner is and why they are your favorite. It could be anyone, uh, but they have to have kind of a running identity. So not just somebody you know who runs, but uh, you know someone who has influenced you, or it could be a professional runner. It could be any just a runner, somebody who is a runner who um, is your favorite and why. And, and again, we'll do like we did last week. 
on Friday, I'll take the responses that I get and I'll pick the one that basically moves me the most. And then uh, that, that person pretty deep, will win $20 off in the Run for God store. Mm. So get to writing some good responses. Do you to have that. a person in your head? You know, it depends on which direction I go. Whether <laughs> I go to my favorite runner as far as from a competitive standpoint mm-hmm. or my favorite person who influenced my life as a runner. Because mm-hmm. then there's, you know, there's only one guy Richard. that it could be. Yeah. Uh, so, Yeah. Hmm. That'd be good. That'd be good to to read those responses. I'd like to see that. Yeah. So send those responses to Dean at runforgod.com. Uh, remember, you have to be a member of Run Club to win, but uh, we'd love to hear responses from everybody. So sure. uh, send those to me and um, win $20 in the Run for God store. Our motivational thought of the week comes from Thomas Aquinas. If the highest aim of a captain were to preserve his ship, he would keep it in port forever. Mm, that's good. We've heard different. We've heard this quote in different ways, mm-hmm. and um, it's it's just always a good one. You know, we're meant to go out and we're meant to do hard things. So, go out there and do them. Become a coach, and you can help other people do them and too. While you're doing it, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sure. It'd be great. And until next week, may God bless every step of every run and or walk. Go out there and shine your light. Good job, Dean. For more information about the Run for God ministry, go to runforgod.com. If you have questions about your salvation, click on the Peace with God tab. There's nothing more important. Thanks for joining us today.